Hey, well, God is good, and no matter what uh, technical difficulties that we've been having tonight, we are going to finish the book of James tonight. Um, several months ago, my family, uh, we decided to make a change with our, with our child care, and instead of our, having our kids leave the home, we hired a nanny to, to come to our house every day and watch our kids. And one of the things that we were really excited about through the interview process that we learned about our new nanny-to-be was that she was a very clean and organized person. And so we are very excited to have somebody clean in our home. And we like to think that the Humpas are clean people, that we're organized people. But with two kids and both of us working full time, our home may not look as clean and organized to you as it does to us. Um, so the night before she started to work for us, I started cleaning like crazy because I did not want our new clean, loving nanny uh, coming to our home and discovering any dust or dirt or any socks that may have gotten pushed under the couch and think that we were disgusting. And so I scrubbed all of our white cabinets. I, with little kids, if you have little kids at home, you know that there's little specks of food that just go flying. And so I had to make sure all of that was gone. Um, I went around with a magic eraser, which is awesome, and made sure all the scuffs were off the walls and there was no crayon on the wall. Um, I went around the whole house, not kidding, on my hands and knees, going around our white uh, baseboards, making sure that there is no dust or any dirt that could have gotten pushed over by the uh, our vacuum and gotten missed. When she arrived, I wanted everything to be spotless. There couldn't be toys left out. There couldn't be beds not made. Our daughter, Chloe, who's four, uh, the first day that our nanny started was the first day that she had to make her bed on her own. And now it's a, a daily thing. And so it was very important to me that everything looked very orderly and very clean. And I'm sure that you can all relate. When someone as special is coming to our home, we want things to be just right. We want things to look like we were expecting their arrival and to be prepared. Um, when we aren't expecting guests, sometimes we can get a little lazy. In our home, Sundays mean no one's coming over and so beds don't get made. Um, several weeks ago, I had cooked dinner and I don't know what had happened, but I had made a huge mess on our stovetop. And so I'm sure that doesn't happen to any of you, um, but that happens to me. Our kitchen was messy. And our kind of rule of thumb is we do dinner, kids go in the bath, put them to bed, and then the kitchen gets all cleaned up. Well, while I was doing bath time, a friend texted that she was on her way to drop some things off. And it's like, okay, great. But then I remembered I have a huge mess on my stovetop, and not just on my stovetop, but in the sink, you know, there's dishes piled up that I had used while cooking, countertops that probably still had remnant of ingredients left out, and things were not tidy. But you can't leave a one-year-old in the bathtub by themselves. And so I had to leave the cleaning. And so as my friend came over, who doesn't normally come to my house, I still had a nasty stovetop that was not clean and I was not prepared and there was just not enough time to hide the fact that I was not prepared. When someone special is coming, we want to be prepared. And as we dive into the book of James tonight, James reminds us that Jesus is coming back and we have a lot of work to do to prepare. If this is your first time uh, watching um, with us on a Sunday night. This isn't normally how things go, but we have been working our way verse by verse through the book of James. James, who is the author of this book of the Bible, provides a really interesting perspective because he's Jesus's half-brother. And so he grew up in the same home as Jesus. Um, he would have a front row seat to watch Jesus. Um, but he doubted Jesus. He didn't believe he was the son of God for a lot of the time that Jesus was on the earth. And then he became a devoted believer and follower of Jesus and even ended up giving his life for the faith. His entire book is a challenge for believers on how we should live. James 5, 7 says, 
Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. James is writing to Jewish Christians who have been scattered throughout the Mediterranean world because of persecution. Have you ever found that in times of suffering, we can begin to get kind of impatient for Jesus to return? It's in these times where we start letting go of the things of this world because we know that our future far outweighs anything that we would experience here. And so it's easy when you're really looking forward to something to lose focus on what you're supposed to be doing in the meantime while we wait for that thing that we really want. My kids have some Easter candy at home that I have for their benefit hidden away in the pantry. And often after dinner, my daughter will ask, can I have a piece of candy? And it's like, okay, sure. You've finished dinner, you can have one. But I tell her, you have to wait. You have to wait until your brother, who is only one years old, is done eating his dinner. And there's a good reason that I do this, because my son also really likes Easter candy. And if he sees her eating her Easter candy, he no longer wants to eat his vegetables or his chicken or whatever I have prepared. He just wants the candy. His focus is solely on the candy. And so he stops doing the good thing, which is eating his dinner, because he's so focused on the treat that is coming at the end of the meal. So James is encouraging them that even in the hard times, hold on to the promise of Jesus' return, but be patient as you wait. So what does this patience look like? Well, he gives a practical illustration as he concludes verse 7. He says, Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. For most of us who live in the Milwaukee area, uh, we're not accustomed to knowing everything that goes into farming. We're just happy that the food is in the stores when we go to get it. But even with our limited farming experience, we can still easily understand the example that James is giving here. Farming takes a lot of patience. There is a long time between the seed being planted and enjoying the harvest. So if you're not familiar with farming at all, here's just some examples. For tomatoes, the wait is between 65 to 85 days until harvest. For corn, the wait is between 60 to 100 days. For potatoes, which get buried underground, it takes about 10 weeks. For an apple, it can take between 6 to 10 years before the seed being planted grows into a big enough tree to start bearing a harvest of fruit. So after the farmer plants the seeds, does he take the summer off? Does he go on vacation? Is his work done? No. No one goes into farming because it's easy work. There is a lot of nurturing and hard work that has to take place before he can enjoy any of the fruit of his labor. You have to make sure that the crop is watered and fertilized, that there's uh, weeding that's taking place. You have pruning, and then you have to protect from the animals and the insects and the people that could cause harm to damage the crop. There is nothing more disappointing than going out to maybe your little hobby garden in the backyard and realizing that an animal has come overnight and eaten whatever vegetable or fruit that you had growing. The farmer must wait patiently for his crops to grow. He can't hurry the process. But while he waits, he doesn't just take the summer off and hope that everything goes well. There is so much work to do to ensure a good harvest. In the same way, we must wait patiently for Christ's return. We can't make him come back any sooner but in our patient waiting, it's not a time to just rest and get lazy. It's an incredible time of self-preparation and working in God's field to bring in the harvest. During this time where we're social distancing and we're not able to uh, be at our workplaces and see our coworkers, we might feel that our personal ministry has been sidelined. But I have seen a lot of people that are really hungry for God in this moment. You can't go through something like what the world is going through without beginning to think about spiritual things. And so what ways can you utilize this time to advance God's kingdom? Could you spend extra time praying for missionaries? Could you check in and call your coworkers, people that you would rub shoulders with every day? Could you just call them and check in to say, 
hey, not how is this work project going, but how are you doing? How are your kids doing with the homeschooling? Is there anything I can pray with you about? You could drop off care packages for your neighbors. And you could just offer a word of appreciation or encouragement to those who are working so hard in the stores that we go to. Each of us has a unique role and opportunity during this time. Addressing his audience again, James says in verse 8, You too must be patient. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. As we patiently await the Lord's return, let's continue to live on mission and not get distracted. Verse 9 says, Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. You know what's really distracting? Other people's faults. For some reason, it's so easy to become just consumed with what other people are doing wrong. And even not so much just what they're doing wrong, but what they're thinking wrong. It's so easy to be bothered by other people's opinions that we don't agree with. And when we dwell on it, and we dwell on it, and we dwell on it, it begins to just bubble up, and we grumble it out about them. James says, guys, no. This is a distraction. This is not beneficial. Don't do it. Don't grumble about each other. The interesting thing about grumbling about each other is that we're usually not taking our issue to the person. We take it to anybody else that will listen. We tell our friends, we tell our spouse, our coworkers, other family members, but we don't address it with the person. James reminds us as believers that we are brothers and sisters. We are a family and we are part of the body of Christ. And while we are grumbling against each other, we begin attacking the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 goes into great detail about what the body of Christ looks like. But I want to go down to 1 Corinthians 12 in verse 26. It says, If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. We work together. If one part is harmed, the whole body is harmed. Christ is coming back for a pure and beautiful bride, a bride that has prepared herself. Let's not give him a bride that's black and blue and all banged up because it's been attacking itself. Sometimes there are hard and uncomfortable conversations that we need to have. They're unavoidable. But have them with the person, not with someone else. And when we have those conversations, we are to remember what it says in Ephesians 4.15, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Are the words coming out of our mouths causing us to look more like Christ? Is the offense highlighting an issue that is going on inside of us? Often the things that bother us the most in others is the very thing that we're struggling with. Jesus tells us in Luke 6, 41, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? We often find what we're looking for. Let's look for the best in each other and make the decision that we aren't going to grumble and tear down the body of Christ. Let's not get distracted with our perceived faults in others. Jesus is coming back, and there is a lot of work to do to prepare. James continues in verse 10. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. We are to be patient as, the Lord, as we wait for the Lord to return, and we are to be patient with others but now James is telling us we need to be patient in suffering. He is saying this to a persecuted church, people who were in the middle of suffering. And he's pulling out the big guns to get his point across. He is reminding them of others who have gone before them, who have gone through a great deal of suffering. This Jewish audience would be very familiar with the Old Testament references. If you are an Old Testament prophet, you are more likely to suffer than to not suffer. They always had a difficult message that they had to deliver to a difficult people under difficult circumstances. 
And even though they struggled in many ways and they were often asked to do difficult things, they endured and persevered. They persevered because they trusted God and knew no matter what, he was worth obeying. After mentioning the prophets, James mentions probably the person that we all think of the most when we think of suffering in the Bible, and that's Job. The Bible describes Job as being blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. Even though this was the character of Job, it didn't spare him from going through suffering. If you're not familiar with Job's story and all that he lost, his cattle, donkeys, and camels were stolen, his sheep were burned up, his servants were murdered, his children all died when they were in a house that collapsed. And in the midst of all of this sudden loss and pain that he had to experience, he then had sores that were very painful cover his body. And with all the questions that had to be circling in his head, he had to endure the pointed finger of his most trusted friends. Those who should have offered comfort instead pointed their fingers in blame. There was nothing that could be done to quickly move Job through the grief and trauma of all he had experienced. There was no quick fix. It would be years before he saw restoration of all that he lost. There are probably days where he thought he was going to go crazy because of the amount of emotional pain that he was feeling. There were so many questions that there was no easy answers for. He couldn't understand why he was suffering so much, especially when he was sure there was nothing that he could have done that could have caused such a punishment. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever asked God, what have I done to deserve all of this? In those times, are we willing to trust God in spite of unanswered questions? James gives his audience the example of Job because it reminds us of his testimony and how he made it through tremendous suffering and was able to persevere. And he was able to persevere because he continued to put his faith and trust in God, and God never let him down. James continues his letter in verse 12 saying, But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be contemned. James here is making reference to what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 34 through 37, But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. As believers, our words should mean something. They should be able to be trusted and stand on their own without having to promise or swear by anything for people to believe they're true. Our track record for telling the truth and standing by what we said we would do should be enough. When our word is not trustworthy, it does not only damage our reputation, but it makes it so much harder for people to take us seriously when we try to tell them about our faith. If we say we're going to do something, we should do it. We should always speak the truth, and if we find out, hey, I spoke wrong and I found out later that I was wrong, we own up to it, we correct it. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. In my Bible, the heading of this next section is called The Power of Prayer. James tells us, starting in verse 13, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Prayer is the foundation of our lives. And James is telling them, no matter what life circumstances we are in, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. Many in his audience were suffering and in persecution. And so when he asks the question, are any of you suffering hardships? He's not speaking specifically to their situation. He keeps it broad and inclusive. Our times of hardship all look different, but the answer for any trial that we face is the same. We are to pray. Often there are two very opposite reactions when hardships come. We either get mad at God and turn from him and pray less, 
or we realize our absolute dependence on him and draw closer to him and pray more. Whatever curveballs life throws at us, don't allow them to cause you to turn on God. Turn to him. Pray to him. Are any of you happy? We don't just spend life in the valleys, but also on the mountaintop. Going through life, we experience so many times of joy and happiness. A new friendship, getting an A on a test, graduating, marriage, a job promotion, a birth of a child, retirement, a vacation, or just everything going our way. James doesn't specify what has caused you to be happy. He just says, if you are happy, you should sing praises. Times of joy and happiness when everything is going our way can be a time when we also turn our focus away from God. We forget our dependence on him because everything is going good. James points us away from living a life of complacency in our adoration of God during these joyful times. We should pray more. We should sing our praises to God and thank him for his goodness. James reminded us early in chapter 1, verse 17, whatever is good and is perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. Are any of you sick? James doesn't specify, again, the severity of the illness. He doesn't say if you just have cancer or have been given a terminal diagnosis to pray. He just asks, are any of you sick? God cares about all of our sickness, whether it's a sore throat, a cold, chicken pox, a brain tumor, whatever we're facing. God's prescription is the same. It's prayer. And he encourages us to bring our needs before others to be prayed for. There is power when the body of Christ comes together and prays over a need. Our practice here at the church of coming forward and being anointed with oil and being prayed over is right out of this passage. James continues on with the power of prayer in verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. This past Wednesday in the kids' digital service, my husband talked to the kids about what it feels like to be stuck in sin. He used the illustration of action figures being covered in slime. The slime poured over them and they were stuck. And that is such a relatable feeling when we have sin in our lives, especially hidden sin. It can cause you to feel completely stuck and isolated. But confession breaks the power that it has over you. Sin is like mold. It likes the dark, hidden areas in our homes to grow and to thrive. And sin also loves to be hidden. But when it's confessed and exposed to the light, it loses its power over you. Confession is like that extra hand you need to begin getting out of slime. Exposed sin loses power. Confess your sins and ask to be prayed over. God wants us to experience the freedom and for sin to lose its grip on our lives. Verses 17 and 18 says, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. After giving all of these life circumstances that we should go to God in prayer in, James uses the example of Elijah to drive home the point of how powerful prayer is. We might be tempted to think that someone else's prayers are more powerful than ours, but James is making the point that that's simply not the case. He says, Elijah was as human as we are. Elijah was just a guy that made the decision to pray earnestly, and he saw amazing things happen. What would happen if we turned our prayers that were just casual requests throughout the day and turned it to earnestly praying for God to move? James challenges us to pray in all circumstances, in every occasion. James closes his letter challenging these believers to watch over one another. Verses 19 through 20 say, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. There's an old hymn called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And I'm not going to sing it, but I will read a portion of it. It says, O to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to be. Let that goodness, like a fetter, 
bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take it and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. How relatable is the temptation to wander, to wander away from the one that we love, to get distracted and to get pulled away. But part of being a part of the body of Christ is looking out for those who might wander away. And when we see someone being tempted to wander away, we go, we seek after them, and we lovingly bring them back. That is what a family does. It watches over each other. It protects each other. This is our responsibility as we patiently await the Lord's return. In closing tonight, I want to go back to the very first chapter in the book of James and read verses 22 through 25. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. The greatest way that we can be all in in our relationship with God is to do what his word says. So as we look at the word from tonight, how can we apply it to our lives? Well, the great thing about the book of James is it's super easy to apply. James tells us that Jesus is coming back, so let's live on mission. It's not a time to get lazy or distracted. And let's make a pact. We're not going to grumble against our brothers and sisters. Let's allow grace and love to flow from our lips. Let's not beat up the body of Christ. Let's encourage each other during times of suffering. Let's share testimonies of how God has brought us through hard times. Just as we read how Job's testimony was used to encourage these Jewish believers to hold on and to persevere, your testimony might make all the difference in somebody's life to keep holding on and to keep persevering until they make it through to the other side. Let's always speak the truth. If we say we're going to do something, let's do it. If we say we're not going to do something, well, let's not do it. Let's always pray. When we're happy, when we're sad, when we are sick, when we are struggling, when we have sinned. And let's look out for one another. Let's encourage each other on in our faith until Jesus comes back. As we close tonight, I just want to pray that, that you would be all in in your relationship with Christ that you would see how easy it is to take God's word and apply it to your life. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that we know you and that you have given us a handbook for how to live out life. And so, Lord, as we have gone through the book of James, Lord, I pray that there would be life verses that would have come through this study and that we would take your word, apply it to our heart, that it would be like that mirror that we're looking through, and that we would see us ourselves for what we really are, that you would expose our areas of sin. Lord, we want to be prepared for when you return. But Lord, whether that is in our lifetime or in a lifetime to come for someone else, Lord, we want to be prepared. We want to build your church and do your work. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak to each one tonight, Lord. Show them their purpose and what you have for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.